The 15th edition of the Transat Jack Vabra race set off from Le Havre on the 7th of November. After 10 days preparing in port, it was time to set off on the longest double-handed transatlantic race, heading for Martinique via a rounding mark in the middle of the Atlantic. Ideal conditions of 15 to 20 knots of wind for the start meant a great show for fans on the Normandy cliffs. The 79 boats were divided into four different classes, ranging in length from 15 to 32 metres. The early part of the race saw all classes share the same course. English Channel, round the tip of Brittany and across the Bay of Biscay. The 50-foot trimarans, the Ocean 50, followed the same course as the 60-foot Imoca monohulls. Both classes having to round the island of Fernando de Noronha. The fastest boats are the Ultimes, who followed a longer course, turning off Brazil before heading up towards Martinique. They would face the doldrums twice. Finally, the Class 40s, the smallest and slowest boats in the race, would round the Cape Verde Islands before heading directly across the Atlantic. What I will remember about this Transat Jacques Vabre is the excitement that all four classes gave us. There wasn't a boring moment. It was richly engaging. A large high-pressure system over the Atlantic meant the early days of the race were very slow for the whole fleet. The all teams took advantage of their size and speed to get through the English Channel on the first night. Escaping the currents around the tip of Brittany, they accelerated down the Atlantic. At their head, Frank Camas and Charles Cadrelier, who'd been first to the turning mark at Etretat and would never relinquish that lead. Behind Maxi Edmund de Rothschild, SVR Lazatigue, Actual, Bank Populaire and Sedebo were trying to keep up with the pace and at times they came close to challenging the leaders, in particular in the light winds of the Bay of Biscay. But no matter what their rivals tried, Maxi Edmund de Rothschild was always better positioned. Camas and Cadrelier continued to extend their lead down to the doldrums. What's down there? Where are we going? So over there to the northwest is Cape Verde. Right in front of us are the doldrums. And once we're through them, we head towards Brazil. Bank Populaire recovered from a bad route choice off Brittany. Armel Leclerc and Kevin Escoffier chose to follow the Spanish and African coasts south before finally catching the leading group. SVR Lazati kept up a good pace before being left behind as they passed the tip of Spain in the only strong winds of the race. There was disaster for Sedebo, who collided with something on day five, were forced to stop in Madeira for repairs and then continue the race with a much diminished boat. The lighter, faster Ocean 50 trimarans came out of the windless conditions best. One boat in particular was able to exploit the situation. Erwin LaRue's Coesio. The purple trimaran of the three times winner of the Transat Jacques Vabre set the pace and held the lead for five days until the Canary Islands. LaRue chose to pass between the islands. His closest pursuers stayed to the west. It was a decision that saw Primonial come out in front. Coesio was left to skirt the African coast, joined by Leighton and Le Petit Doudou, before eventually turning west to rejoin the main group. It's breakfast time on board Le Petit Doudou. I've taken out the couscous as we're off the coast of Morocco. It's a seasonal dish. Soon, it will be the tropics. Primonial had found the trade winds and were away. After seven days at sea, Sebastian Rogue and Matthew Subban reached Cape Verde with a lead of 170 miles. 
It was an advantage they held to the doldrums, where Coesio mounted a short-lived comeback. Primonial exited the doldrums first, picked up the trade winds and regained total control, reaching the waypoint at Fernando de Noronha on their 11th day at sea. A big right turn launched them into the final sprint towards Martinique. Hi everyone, welcome aboard the Primonia rocket. It's the express to Martinique. We passed Fernando de Noronha last night, and since then we've been attacking all the way down the no-go zone along the coast of Brazil. It's quite a challenge because we've got 25 knots of wind and we're rolling at an average of 24, 26 knots. The fleet then embarked on a jibing match along a no-go zone, enforced by race management to avoid the busy fishing areas off northern Brazil. After a poor start to the race, Leighton were back in it. Sam Goodchild and Aymeric Le Chapelier, now second, were battling it out with Coesio, Solidaire on Peloton and Le Petit Doudou. In the ensuing duels, two boats fell back and out of the running. Arkema 4 and Group GCA. Here is a tour of the boat. There is Yvon, who's doing the cooking and sailing at the same time. He's studying the weather forecast on the computer. And we're having lunch at the same time. There's a lot of equipment involved. And as you can hear, the noise is infernal. 24 hours a day. In the Amoka class, Apivia, the big race favourite, had made the best of the light airs. She had led the early stages around the tip of Brittany and past Cape Finisterre. But it's in the unstable Portuguese trade winds that Thomas Rouillon and Jeremy Bayou begin to claw the distance back from Apivia. On day six, approaching the island of Madeira, Linked Out and Chiral head west of the fleet. Apivia chooses to stay east for too long and for the first time relinquishes her lead to her rivals. So we meet again Charal. The Apivia Charal duel continues at daybreak. The battle rages on, with linked out also not far away. It's a raging battle, isn't it? A real duel to the end. Yup, a bloody duel. Linked out led to the Canary Islands before the fleet split into two. The chasing group, made up of Initiative Kerr, Arkea Paprek and 11th Hour Racing Malama, chooses to skirt the African coast and benefit from the thermal breezes created by the heat of the Mauritanian desert. Further west, the leading trio of Linked Out, Apivia and Chiral are within 50 miles of each other. The crews are engaged in an intense game of cat and mouse. Happy Sunday on board Charal. Time for the Sunday roast. Crossing the tricky doldrums changed nothing in the rankings, and soon the 60-footers were heading for a waypoint of Fernando de Noronha. Linked out reaches the archipelago on the night of the 20th of November after 13 days at sea. Apivia is second, Chiral third. These fast foilers have extended their lead and are now more than 300 miles ahead of Initiative Kerr and Arkea Paprek in 4th and 5th. For the smaller and slower Class 40s, exiting the English Channel proved more than a little laborious. It turned into a tour of Brittany and gave rise to some epic scenes the lack of wind and the strong currents forcing sailors to sneak in and out of the shoreline to try to get into the Bay of Biscay. But here again, the high pressure turned the regatta into a slow motion race. Alexis Loison's La Manche and Luke Berry's La Motte fought it out for first place throughout that first week. It was only off the coast of Spain that that chasing pack caught up with the leaders. After six days at sea, Antoine Carpentier's Redman moved into the lead for the first time. 
Hello everyone, welcome to Redman. We've had a crazy 48 hours, but we've regained the lead, so we're very happy. Just behind Bank du Le Mans, Volvo and Eden Red were waiting to pounce as they skirted the African coast. The Canary Islands split the fleet, but Redman stayed in front, leading down to Cape Verde, where they turned for the long crossing to Martinique. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Cape Verde Islands, which means we're halfway into the race. The Canaries, the Canaries that's great. Cape Verde next. Ooh. With Cesaria Evora. We're coming. We're already barefoot. Meanwhile, in the Martinique capital, Fort de France, preparations for the finish were complete, with the pontoon of honor ready to welcome the first of the 77 competitors still racing. The Martinique people are here, everything is ready, the atmosphere is good, and the race village is magnificent. I've been watching this third leg of the Transat Jacques Vabre with amazement as the village has been built and thinking, we've done it. We're ready to welcome our sailors. Attention pour l'arrivée de Primonial. Top arrivée de Primonial. On Monday, the 22nd of November at 9 p.m., Sebastian Rogue and Matthew Subin crossed the finish line of the 15th edition of the Transat Jacques Vabre in first place in the Ocean 50 class. Primonial had taken 15 days, 13 hours, 27 minutes and 14 seconds and covered 6,536.56 miles at an average speed of 17.5 knots. The winning skippers were overjoyed. Very nice victory, nice sailing. There was a very clever weather move in the Canaries where they shifted to the west and that eventually gave him the lead. But taking the lead is one thing, keeping it is another. They sailed magnificently. We really gave it our all and didn't hold anything back. We gave everything we had and it paid off, more than paid off. Spending 15 days on the boat with Matt was great. Over the next four hours through the Martinique night, Coesio and Leighton completed the podium. We didn't give up. We shook up this race and got people talking. We played our part, so it was really cool. Third place isn't bad, and it was but it's a great transit. Um, we we had a we we got off on a bad foot probably the first 12 hours, and we kind of dragged that that deficit through the rest of the race. Um, but really happy to come back to third and um, and gain some places going through the doldrums and get back into get back onto the podium. Um, and now we're tidling forward to some sleep. For the all teams, the final sprint was just as breathtaking. Maxi Edmund de Rothschild was slowed right down in a windless zone off Barbados. The others closed in, but just in time, the breeze returned and she crossed the finish line on Tuesday 23rd. Frank Camas and Charles Caudrelier took 16 days, 1 hour, 49 minutes and 16 seconds to cover 9,262.13 miles, averaging 24.01 knots. The pair were race leaders for 98% of the time. Logic won it. They were favourites, and once they had the lead, their perfect knowledge of the boat, perfect teamwork won through. Franck and Charles ticked all the boxes.
This will be remembered as a great race. It was the longest Jacques Vabre I've ever done. Same for Charles, 7,500 miles, it's a very long race. So we are delighted to have arrived with a boat that's 100% and above all, in front. Behind them, the next few hours were intense and SVR Lazatique did not give up, managing to steal second place from Banque Populaire on the last few tacks. There's a great winner up front, and behind us, they also fought hard. What happened in the last 48 hours with Bank Pop was just great. We had a blast, and we are super happy. We would have liked to hold on to second place, which was ours for much of the race, but in the end, there are a lot of positives to come from this. I'm on the podium with Kevin with a boat that is in good shape, so all good. Bien en forme aussi, donc tant mieux. While the pontoons were filling up with multi hulls, the mono hulls were still racing. In the stifling heat, the Amoka boats continued their close racing up the coast of South America. The trade winds, though, were not stable and restricted the sailors' strategy options as they followed the course along the no-go area off Brazil. At the front, Thomas Rouillard and Morgan Lagravier found some extra acceleration thanks to their good downwind speed. It made all the difference. Linked out was more than 150 miles ahead of Charlie Dallin and Paul Mayat Sapivia, who were definitely off the pace in these conditions. Chiral sat third, the ranking seemed to have been frozen. There's a little less than two days to the finish, scheduled for the morning of the 25th. You can see the trade winds are a little weak and erratic. They vary between 10 and 14 knots. It's not huge but we shouldn't find a little more pressure this evening up to the finish. More than 400 miles behind, still struggling with the residue of the doldrums, Arkea Paprec and Initiative Kerr were racing close up. How many days of racing left? That's the big question. You'd expect three days of racing from here? So the challenge now is to stay ahead of the boats behind us. And if we manage to upset Arkea, who's just ahead, that would be good. But I don't think they're going to let us do that. <laughs> Even further back, Corum made a superb comeback and showed great downwind qualities to catch 11th hour racing's Malama. Co-skippers Charlie Enright of the USA and Pascal Bidigori of France had lost places as they struggled with the damaged keel. Thursday, 25th of November, after 18 days at sea, Thomas Rouillard and Morgan Lagravier crossed the line to take the Amoka title after nearly 6,700 miles at an average of 15 knots. There's a time for everyone, I would say. There's a time when it has to come, and here it has come for Linked Out and Toma, and it's great because it deserves it. I don't know if it's the best race because I've done four Transat with different teams, but it's certainly one of the best because it's shared. 
Because there is a whole team behind it. And that's what drives me and what makes me happy. It's all the sharing that we're going to manage to create around this victory. That's why we're doing it. And all that good stuff starts now. <laughs> In the early hours of Friday morning, it was Apivia's turn to approach Diamond Rock. Charlie Dallan and Paul Mayer finished second, 20 hours behind the winner. We lacked two or three small ingredients, a touch of success and a touch of speed in certain conditions, but I'm very happy with this second place. Chiral crossed the line the following night to complete the podium for the 60-foot monohulls. We always race to win, but you have to be satisfied with a podium, especially when you have great winners like Thomas and Morgan, who did a great job, both in terms of strategy and speed. We tried to optimize what we had as much as possible. We didn't make any mistakes, but they were better than us. So, big congratulations to them. For the class 40s, the race had been long, with unusually light winds and unseasonal weather patterns. On the approach to the West Indies, the seaweed added to the problems. We are into the last three days and the sargassum is everywhere. It gets caught in the keel, in the rudders. It's just hell. So what's the solution? The seaweed cane to remove it from the rudders. Proof it works, a clear wake. We are bogged down in Sargassum. You know what I mean. The race is much longer than expected. Tiredness is growing and the heat is becoming a real problem. So Massa is saying, if you want to become cooler, you have to steer. In the closing stages of the race, Redmond continued to dominate. Behind her, the tightly bunched pack had grown to 10. Antoine Carpentier was under pressure. With Pablo. With Pablo, sunrise with a big, big cloud over there. We hope it's not going to bother us too much but it's already the case as the wind just dropped. So the gaps will get smaller to add a little bit of stress as if we didn't have enough of it. On Monday 29th of November, Antoine Carpentier and Pablo Santour de Delarco won the Class 40 Transat Jack Barbara in 21 days, 22 hours, covering 5,500 miles at an average speed of 10 knots. I want to cry with relief. With Pablo, we gave it our all. We were the best. For Carpentier, it's a third consecutive victory in two different boat classes. I have always said a good victory requires effort, and we were under pressure all the way to the end. We could see the Swiss were coming back at us with the wind building behind them. We worried how much that wind would grow. It's great when you fight like that. That's what we like. So we're very happy to finish first. It was tough, but that's what we like. Second place went to Banque du Le Mans. After 22 days of racing, the Swiss pair of Valentin Gautier and Simon Costa were just one hour and four minutes behind the winners. No, no, no not, uh, not disappointed at all. We would have taken this before the start. It's a close fleet with many well-trained and well-prepared sailors. We are very happy to be here in this position. It was third for Cédric Chateau and Jérémy Mion who made the podium after a great final week comeback. 
on n'a jamais pensé à remonter. We never expected to make the podium at our first attempt. To have even made the top 10 would have been incredible. But when we found ourselves there, we just kept going. Et encore jusqu'à quelques jours parce que là on était bien revenu et It was a huge blow when our spinnaker ripped but we kept pushing gave it our all and we've done it On s'est donné corps et âme dessus et ça l'a fait C'est un super cru It's what we'd hoped for at the start euh, dans le bassin. And the race has delivered. On, on voyait bien la, la bagarre à venir vu, le, vu la qualité. The 2021 edition has turned out to be a vintage Jacques Vab race. Donc c'est vraiment une, une très, un très très beau cru Jacques Vab 2021. Voilà. Despite the unusual weather for the season, the race lived up to its promise of intensity and high-performance racing. See you again in 2023 for the next Transat Jacques Vabre race.